Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to a brand new podcast all about MotoGP. My name is Harry Benjamin, and every week I'll be joined by former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewitt and a special guest to discuss all the latest from the MotoGP paddock and beyond. Now, I think a lot of you watching and listening to this would have jumped over from our last podcast we did. So thank you very much for joining us on this new venture. Uh, and to anyone new, you're very welcome here as well. Uh, before we get into all of it, though, a bit of admin for you. Uh, it would mean the world if you're able to follow us on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We are at OMG MotoGP. Uh, we're also on YouTube, so please do subscribe. Again, just search OMG MotoGP. And if you're an audio listener, we're on every single podcast player there is. So search OMG MotoGP and hit that subscribe button. One last thing, please do leave us a review wherever you're listening or watching this from. It's a massive boost for the various podcast algorithms. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, we also have an email address, OMGMotoGP at gmail.com. Send us your questions, voice note uh, them 30 seconds, and we'll get them on the show. Equally, other thoughts and opinions are very much welcome. And finally, finally, I know, a massive thank you to Motormouth who are producing this podcast. So do check out the Motormouth podcast too, where you can hear in-depth stories from some of the world's uh, biggest stars within motorsport. Okay, okay, we're ready now. Uh, so let's get on with it, shall we? Shall we? Um, I'm actually going to shut up and hand over to Keith now because Keith actually did some hard work and booked in our first guest. So um, Keith, you can do the introductions. It's never hard work when I'm booking in Julian Ryder. That is for absolute certain. It wouldn't be a British Grand Prix weekend without me and Jules having a, an argument or two. Will this be the uh, five-minute argument, Jules, or the full 30 minutes, I wonder? Oh, we'll go for the full the full 30 minutes minimum, Keith. Possibly, uh, possibly the repeat. <laughs> pleasure to see you, Julian. It really is a pleasure to see you. Uh, the British Grand Prix, obviously, is the big one in the calendar. It's a, it's a bit... It's not quite like the Monaco of F1, but it's very similar in that as much as if there's one that a rider wants to win, doesn't matter what nationality he is or where he comes from, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone seems to be one of the most important Grand Prix of the year. Yes, and I think this position now in the calendar after the break, the way that Aston used to be and Bruno used to be, gives it you know extra because you know that deals have been done and we're about to find out as well. And it's an epic track. I mean, that's... That's the bottom line. But do you know what? How many years have we got to a situation where you come away feeling a little disappointed, a little cheated? And I think this year is one of those for me as well. I mean, I, really? I, I, I don't want to be negative on, on about Dorna. I don't want to be negative about Silverson because I know how much effort goes into those things. Uh, but it was one of those ones this year where you got to the Day of Champions on the Thursday, which is like the precursor, the warm-up for all of us. We all turn up to to do our charity bit yeah. for uh, Day of Champions for Two Wheels for Life, as it is the, the recognised MotoGP uh, charity, of course. And it started off well, as usual, with that, looking at the old bikes, lots of people turned up. But you've got the, the first immediate impression you get as soon as you turn up at Silverstone is how bloody vast it is. It's massive, oh, it's massive, massive place. And because this year they're using the wing... To try and I think that the, I think the object of the exercise, Jules, and this will be the, the the comment I'm looking for from you is they're trying to align themselves with F1. They're trying to not look like the secondary motorsport series that happens at Silverstone. Yeah. Well, for me, w we tried the wing the first time we went back there, and it didn't work. It it just doesn't. It's not big enough. It's too dislocated. Other addicts. So. No, the wing is a an eyesore anyway. Well, it's, uh, got a high, it's got a hotel now and a little bit of a link to the other side, of course. I mean, things have changed yeah. a bit, but it, it's still one of those slightly awkward places. They're, they've got buses to run. Because, again, it, because of its size, the size of where the track is and everything, you need a, a bus to get to the wing from most of the car parking. So it's, it's aiming in Austin, isn't it? You know, it's not the first track where you've need, needed to hop on a bus. But that's all tarmac. One of the problems you have here, and one of the things I did notice, I met up with a good friend of mine, Gary Cow, and a good friend of yours as well, actually, Gary. Gary, I, I, I... A great Northern Irish rider. Used to ride for, for Kenny Roberts, was was paralysed from the chest down, was in a Daytona accident, sadly. There was a Grand Prix winner, minimum. Absolutely. Brilliant guy, brilliant rider back in the day, for those of you that would follow Gary. And, of course, Gary was at uh, the weekend. He was over, over the weekend at uh, the British Grand Prix. And I remember thinking to myself, Things we don't notice as able-bodied people are gravel tracks to get to yeah. places. Um, and, if, and if you're in a wheelchair, that's a major obstacle. 
and now we've got buses that you've got to try and get a wheelchair on or get to the other part of the the other side of the track. Uh, it, it just seemed to be slightly disjointed. Although, as I say, Silverstone made a massive. I'll tell you one massive plus point for Silverstone. It was well manned by good, obviously fantastic marshals on track side, but, yes. but by the marshals that were looking after the the, the punters. I, I found them really helpful, really trying hard to make make your make you welcome at the track, which is. Important. I think I think Silverstone learned that lesson after the first year back, where they had a bunch of bloody Rupert and ex regimental ties. Who I, you know, you know what a calm, considered person I am, Pete. You know, never argue with anybody. I told one what to do on a couple of occasions, you know. So they were, they, uh, they, they, Silverstone got that right. They turned that round very quickly. In, well, in terms of the numbers, numbers. pointed line, then shall I? Of course. I mean, if, if 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 I had Silverstone's luck, I would never fly on an aeroplane. That is a fact. Yeah. Because the weather. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you just uh, unfortunately every weather forecaster seemed to be anti motor GP during the course of the week prior. I was out on that main stage in the wind and the rain. Thank you very much. Well, you're lucky to have hair that you don't have to brush in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> when the wind and the rain's blowing across, my flap starts to lift. It's, it's, it's quite dangerous. A bit, of extra, a bit of extra glue, Keith, and then that will stay down. Be fine. I've seen him take off from Phillip Island. It is all my own hair. It's just stuck down. <laughs> Stop it. It's most of it's older than him. <laughs> I, you like to exercise these old jokes on me now and again, George, don't you? Now, it is nice to give them a run out again, isn't it? <laughs> give an old joke of the home for Christmas. I'm going to ring your missus. She's the only one that, that, that likes my jokes about you. Yeah. <laughs> we write them down for a few years. But it's kind of one of those situations where the, the weather, you know, Friday qualifying was was a, was a was tricky. And then we got to Saturday. Oh. The only good thing I suppose you can say about Saturday was Silverstone drained brilliantly. The, the new surface, the drainage, coped very, very well with it. And yes. it, you know they ran in conditions that a lot of tracks wouldn't be able to run in. And it got marginal at some points, didn't it? It really did. But it, but it ran and it worked, as you say. That's another tick in the box. I kept saying all that day as well. If this, if this was happening over the Formula One. Red flag. There would have been no cars on track in this kind of weather, and I was I was taken aback because I know you know bikers are made of harder stuff, but it just it, it, in these kind in those kind of conditions, you know, bikes on track just seems like a bit of a nervous situation to be in. Well, I'm inclined to agree with you, Harry, because I was you know watching it, some of it, thinking just flag that she's that she's ridiculous. You know, it's um, the grid's going to be a lottery in these conditions. Uh, people are going to get hurt because you don't have a slow crash even in the wet and so on the snow. And in every cloud, me sorry, yeah. you've got varied dr- grids and varied. I mean, I quite like a wet race now. It's a, a great leveler. Yeah, Do it, sprinkled through a season, if you'll excuse the phrase. Uh, yeah, couldn't agree more. And of course, what it meant was that we ended up with um, my next set of disappointments in, in that that. Um, Jake Dixon was put in a position on the grid that we all know, as soon as you end up in a position on the grid where you, you aren't naturally supposed to be, you, you, you leave yourself open for a, for a problem, of course, which he had. We will cover that later. Yep. And also, I mean, Scott Ogden should have had his first pole position, but he had it taken away from him because yes. of, he started a lap under a yellow flag rather than, yep. you know, and he wasn't a yellow flag that, while he was out there. That was very unfortunate. Totally but, middle of the front row wasn't bad. Exactly. We, we'll we'll come on to Moto Two and Moto Three a little later on, but just to just sort of uh, get uh, back to Silverstone, um, Stephen has uh, tweeted us a question, uh, and actually maybe it helps to know the sort of numbers that Silverstone released. Friday, just over twenty seven thousand people through the gate. Saturday, just over thirty nine thousand. Sunday, forty eight thousand five hundred or so. So overall, almost one hundred and sixteen thousand across the weekend. Compare that with Formula One, and I know you shouldn't. What was it, 480,000 across the weekend for Formula One? But you shouldn't compare that. Apparently, for MotoGP, that's up from last year. But, I mean, from where I was on the main stage, and, and a lot of the grandstands weren't even open, and, and especially on that Saturday, everyone ran for the grandstands to sit in them and the ones that were covered, and they didn't move at all for the rest of the day just to get make sure they were still you know covered. On the main stage, I mean... It wasn't exactly a packed out crowd, even when we had the riders come down for interviews. And Stephen kind of picks up on this. And do you think, does he, oh, well, he asks you, do we think Silverstone 
is a little bit soulless should it go back to somewhere like Donington? No, it's a real shouldn't. It's it's a real conflict. I know I'm, I'm, I understand where Jules is coming from on that, and I'll, I'll follow that one up in a minute. No, it couldn't, and it, and it couldn't, and it shouldn't really, as Donington is at the moment. I mean, Donington's a, a great racetrack, but it's all of the riders, pretty much all of the riders. I mean, there are very few dissenting voices across the classes love Silverstone as a racetrack. But I absolutely understand what Stephen is 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 texting us about. I had my eight year old with me, and we walked the track, walked on the banking. And it was empty. I mean, I've I've been to club races that have had more people on some of these classic, you know, anywhere from the inside of Cops through Maggots and Beckett's. You can just walk anywhere and see whatever you want to see. Um, and it was it was it was completely empty. And the, the old paddock, the, the main paddock that we would have used in was a was a truck park. It was the the power units for for all of the hospitality and everything that and where they parked them this year. And it was soulless. If even the coffee house that's next to the cafe there, you could walk in and get a coffee at any time. You didn't have to queue any time during the course of the weekend. You could walk straight in. And it, okay, so if it, it's doing a quarter of the business, so therefore a quarter of the investment reasonably seems to be what Silverstone are, are paying for. And and but it, it's it's when do you get over this threshold, Jules? Is the question I suppose. We had the the big union flag on the on the grid, and we had the national anthem uh, rendition. Of course, we did, um, but no flyby, no raz, real razzmatazz. Not that yeah. that Cota Circuit of the Americas, you know, and so on and so forth. It just yeah. felt a little flat. Let's go back to the basics. Let's go back a bit, Keith. We're both capable of this, given our age. Did anybody complain about Silverstone back in the day? No. First came back where? Well, no, they didn't. Is the racing at Silverstone good? Yes, it's usually absolutely magnificent. And although there's some beautiful views at Donington Park, and it, uh, I'm sure it's wonderful to ride, tell me a race at Donington that came anywhere near the class of what we saw this last weekend and other weekends. Yeah, I mean, Silverstone, fast-flowing track like that. Motor 3 was magnificent. The the, the main race, Motor GP, was absolutely... I think yeah. Motor 2, unfortunately, with the out-of-order thing, where you have Motor 3, yeah. Motor GP, and Moto 2, it falls a little flat for Moto, Moto 2, particularly with Jake Dickson now. I, I agree, but that's, sort of a, that's a fault of time zones as much as anything else, isn't it? That uh, same applies in Portugal, you know. Like it used to be when we used to have the 250s after 500, it always felt... And I've been in Brazil years ago. We had the 500s first to fit with television times in Europe. And, not, you know, once they'd seen Alex Barros, the crowd went home. Is it on the subject? That's a link that I'm, I want to pick up on there, Jules. Television. Um, nothing much has changed. It's the same old thing, really, at the end of the day. Um, but I was really, because I only lived 20 minutes from the track, it meant that I could watch a bit of qualifying and then nip up to the <laughs> track. <laughs> um, so... But I was really disappointed with the sound over commentary. You know, we, it's an argument you and I have had for some time. There was there was no real noise from the bikes. It was it no. sounded like they were... Well, I spoke to somebody over the weekend about that to try and work out why the commentators were so loud compared with the bikes. And it's one of the reasons is, is because it's going out live around the track as well, using the television sound. Our the television monitor. sound is the PA, yes. Yeah. So it meant that they, they sort of pushed the the commentary and not the bike sound and that made it flat on the telly for me i you know it was all right well, on board because you had the onboard sound then and it sounded like a proper yeah. motorbike yeah. but it was when you would it just sounded like the commentators were too loud and we weren't getting enough atmosphere a bit i have to say harry <laughs> like formula one <laughs> I, I i think personally i i don't think that's a real issue to be honest i, I think for hardcore you know like yourselves uh, and for proper bikers and I'm aware of who our audience is. Yes, they want the sound, but if you want the sound, go to the track. You're not always going to be able to get it on the TV screen because it, it, you know it, it's got to be broadcast. It's got to be appealable for 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 a broadcast across the world. And and equally, you want to hear what the commentators say. Often, you know, I watch a race without commentary, and you know, you, you do you, you miss the commentary. Oh, you know, I'm by it. I'm by it. I was making. No, I think that it was just that it lost, it lacked atmosphere on TV. Well, what, it, was that the empty grandstands as well? Well, I mean, like that it, never helps. Yeah, but it, it never helps. Really... If you if if you're looking in depth to the visuals of seeing empty grandstands, that kind of you wonder why. 
but it doesn't really affect your enjoyment of the race as such. But for me, you know, pushing the sound of them, but yeah, at the end of the day, it, 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 what you're used to, Harry, when it comes to Formula One nowadays, you've gone from V12s to, to, you know, clocks and watches and electric things, haven't you? Which, which means that the, the, the noise is so much less. Talking of electric things, what did you think of the Moto E Ducatis? Racing is great. I mean, I, 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 I've, I've always said that I really, I mean, there's some great riders in Moto E. As a, They're not know, bad, are they? It's, it's now a world championship as well. It's not a, a world cup anymore. It's class a world championship. It's still not a Grand Prix. No. But I mean, the racing is great. It's just not long enough. And honestly, uh, that is the opposite. I'd rather listen to them on telly because you can't hear them than be at the track. The track side, all you can hear is whining going on. It's probably me. If you're in the right place, you can hear the riders yelling, going into corners. With yeah, you can. You can. And you can, I'll tell you what you can hear, Jules. You can hear their knee sliders over the rumble strips. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as they go across the rumble strip. That's cool, cool. though. That's a whole different kind of uh, uh, perspective. I think, yeah. I think, Harry, that's where Jules and I are obviously of a certain age and a certain era. And we've gone through lots of different incarnations of MotoGP over the years mm. from... Mm. from 800s to thousands to two strokes to, to whatever you like so it's something that Jules and I have, 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 have dipped into all around all around the world and over a great number of years but you as a youngster you've been brought up on the on the, the, the new theories of, of how we need to be sustainable and how it needs to be um, you know progressed over the next few decades um, so it's, it's interesting your take is slightly different from ours and perfectly natural well, to me, when it comes to the sound idea, you know, yeah, there, you know, there is something about hearing a, a V12 or whatever it might be. You know, you feel it in your chest; it, 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 it powers through you. But at the same time, when it comes to watching a race, I don't really care as long as the racing's good. I don't really mind what they sound like. Personally, that's that's probably more of a personal view than maybe a, a younger generational view. Well, it's one to throw open, isn't it, to our viewers? It's it's this is something that is generic across uh, sporting sports on television. Watching a football match on the telly is not the same as being in a football ground. You don't get that, you know, V12 bit of sound, you know, when something great happens or a goal is scored, thumping you in the head or, you know, you're you looking at your phone or something. And, what the hell was that? You know, it's, it's not like that when you're watching on telly. And for purely practical reasons, mainly, of not hearing a load of swearing and two, hearing the commentary. Yeah, well, I look, it, it, it's clearly a thing we, I want to throw up into our, our listeners and viewers. So do let us know and get in touch about how, you know what, what brings the enjoyment for you. Um, I want to get on to the actual on-track action, though, if I may. Um, and uh, right at the top with MotoGP, I mean, Keith, let's start. with. A, I want to start with Alacious Barbro, because when he made that move, I think I screamed Alacious so loudly. I, <laughs> I don't know what came over me. It was coming, it was coming. I wasn't quite sure he was going to do it in time. And then he nicked it from Van Yai on the final lap. It was a brilliant move. And it's one of those ones where Jules will be, uh, yeah, in fact, you're a commentator as well, so you'll be across this. It's the kind of what, kind of move that you wish you had been commentating on. Absolutely. And of course, you knew it. You know you could have done it better than they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was a fantastic talk to us, Keith. Oh, he's there. I'm here. You, you you got so excited you froze. Um, a leash was brilliant, but it looked, you know, it was a wonderful move, but it looked totally safe, totally in control, totally calculated. And I'm sure it wasn't quite as comfortable as you made it look. Well, I mean, it's, I, I think the Aprilia has looked really, really well. I think the, the, the Bagnaya's fires were just, you know, he knew that he would be slightly borderline later on in the race and he didn't have yes. anything to respond. But I think the, the execution of it was perfect. Alacious Barber, only his second win, and in, I think it's 310 Grand Prix or something like that. You know, so at the end of the day, I, I, I think they might well be celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> and Aprilia, Maverick wasn't far away, and there was a tie when I thought only there was going to win that race. Oh, like Maverick, oh. Maverick was fighting like I've not seen Maverick fight for a long time, actually. Absolutely. I mean, he was right. He was in it to win it. There's no doubt. Yeah. Was it, was it that the raindrops, maybe, that Maverick just had a. Uh, a fraction of a thing that uh, certainly Brad Binder didn't. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, and, and also we got Bezeki that's had diabolical luck. He had that massive off on Friday, and and then of course was out of it. You would have expected Bezeki to have been in there as well. I mean, it was a, 
but it was a it was it was a great motor gp race and it was great because alish won on aprilia and aprilia they're there the smallest factory really in the in the paddock and and they're right there and the fourth aprilia get in the top 10 as well for the first time they did indeed it, yeah it was a good run uh for uh um the the rnf uh aprilias, wasn't it augusto fernandez yeah. uh or the other fernandez even ralph fernandez um doing uh, uh yeah, it's so easy to see that, isn't it? Which one is it? Oh, it's that one. Um, and I, again, the, screaming the, the gal, but he fell back towards the end. I think the big is- issue as well, Harry, is is that we've been talking about it this year a lot, about the, the turn of Japanese bikes versus European bikes. We've got European bikes now. I mean, I, I just I had, to re- I had to check the stats this morning because I thought, for, I can't do this from memory, otherwise it'd be a pain. 14th place was the first Japanese bike. More, and it, that's strangely it? enough. Franco Morbidelli, uh, the man that looks like he's moving <laughs> moving across to uh, Europe, a European bike next year. But uh, Morbidelli, 14th place, the first Japanese bike, and he was the first Japanese bike in the sprint race on the Saturday. Unbelievable, isn't it? How quickly has this happened? Mm. Well, it's not... <laughs> oh, the Honda. Honda. Mm. It's, it's, I don't know whether it has been quickly, because you can see back to 2007 when Ducati won their last world title. Uh, it, it was it was a long time in the wilderness with the front end that wouldn't go where you wanted it to go and so on yeah. and so forth with you get yeah. it. Uh, and if it's going to take the, the Japanese that long to recover from where they are at the moment, yeah. we've got a long time of European well, domination. Honda's decline has sort of been slow and sickeningly steady, but Yamaha's decline appears to have been... Yeah, you know, overnight. Well, I think... I think Honda's has been exacerbated by the by the deterioration of 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 Mark Marquez. I think all their eggs are in that basket. And Mark Marquez, he's not interested. He he predicted twelfth. Have you ever heard Mark Marquez predict a twelfth place? And sure, I'm really nearly as shocked by that as I was when I encountered Troy Bayliss years ago in the in the airport in Seville, and he told me he was happy with sick. And I, in, <laughs> in, you know, I had to and, get the defibrillator out. Well, I mean, I, I, exactly that when it came to Mark Marquez. I've never seen him look so flat on a motorbike or so flat in person either. I mean, normally he's he's a bit cheeky with, you know, if he's predicting 12th, he's got something a bit better in, in the tank he's looking for. But even getting on and off the bike, he looked stiff. When he was on the bike, he didn't look right. And in, in the race, when he sort of he, he led his teammate through, so he could have a look at the Honda from behind to correlate with what he was thinking. I think he's just collecting enough data for when he changes the the next year. <laughs> well, well, on this, right, you've gone to Mark Marquez, so let's do it. I mean, I almost forgot he was racing this weekend. I had to double check he was actually there at one point. Um, yeah. I mean, there were some rumours of KTM coming into the weekend. Uh, and now uh, Jay has said, it looks like Mark is clock watching. What do you think about the Grassini Ducati rumours? And Jack adds on to that. I feel like Mark is mentally and physically done. This weekend, he was a completely different guy, as you guys have both mentioned. He looked demotivated. And the only thing that will change that is a new team. What do you think? Well, he had his brother into the Honda camp at one stage, didn't he, before he moved him across into uh, Lucio Cecchino's camp. So you can pretty well bet that Alex has um, already warmed up a seat for Mark to come across to um, his particular Ducati team. Two brothers in the same team? happened before oh, i see that would, that would be and interesting the, well it would be from several points because alex marquez is suddenly actually coming up to the mark that mark marquez always used to say about him do you remember you always used to say his brother was better than him Keith, sprint winner how many, how many championships have we we talked about the the younger marquez going well he's all right but and then a year later oh he's quite good and then next season good lord he's world champion you know it's <laughs> Uh, it's true. He it usually happened in three years, didn't it? Yeah, he plateaus, but he doesn't take a backward step. You know, there'll be that sort of constant, well, he's there or thereabouts, you know, and then suddenly there's that kick up. Well, he's having one of them at the minute. And of course, as I started this theory off on uh, the luck at Silverstone, he didn't have any at, uh, in the end on, on race day, but uh, he didn't. But winning his his first one on on the sprint race on Saturday was pretty impressive, and he won it handily, didn't he? That- well, it was deteriorating in conditions. Me and my eight year old stood out at cops watching, and it and the wind picked up in the last three or four races, uh, three or four races, three or four laps, and the drizzle started to come in that area. Because I remember I texted Oji to say it's, it's raining over here now. He didn't yeah, take yeah. any notes, of course. <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> and then 
shortly after that, he started to go all the way around the track and get wetter and wetter. And yeah. and, and and basically, he, he, he hung on in there. I, I reserve the right to be impressed. I thought he handled it really well. Well, it was uh, it was nice to see one Marquez uh, doing well at least. Um, we see what happens with with old Mark. Um, I want to come back. Let's we mentioned Ducati there, obviously. Peko Bagnaia leading the way uh, in the uh, well for the majority of the race, and of course still in the championship. Um, but should he uh, have been penalised? Yeah, for the track I wonder whether you were going to get to this. <laughs> the the build up was very slow, Harry, but I was hoping you were going to get. I think um, I wrote two thousand words about this not long ago. <laughs> it just this this bloody green paint business. I mean, at the end of the day, the the camera angle that I saw says he should have been penalised. Yeah. The the data from the sensors at the side of the track says he shouldn't, and the stewards went with that he shouldn't. Um, personally, it looked like that tire was on the green to me. And uh, they were talking about the angle he was at because of the height of the curb meant that the tire didn't touch the green. You know. Some kind of, so so he's obviously perfected levitation in some way or another. Yeah, I think somebody's claiming the laws of physics and optics have been suspended for a while there. It's tosh, isn't it? Well, it does feel like tosh. And again, it, I I hate these things where we keep finding you know negatives in in what's going on. But yeah. but all of the time we are having these negative arguments. I, I I actually I actually would be pleased if the stewards backed off a little bit from from these bloody penalty situations. So if this is a trend that's going to be consistent, and there is the word that isn't the, isn't the case, um, then and, let's go that way. And as I always, you know, forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but we actually at least got something from the stewards saying how the decision was made. I, Which, well, hallelujah. Well, we've got this. Have you, have you tuned into this new Sportify? Not yet. There's a Sportify app. Yeah. And it's got the FIM part of it. And you can actually go on Sportify now and it will give you an explanation as to which is where it is, it is the FIM's responsibility, of course. Well, they're, well they're, they're probably busy having lunch for about three hours in the middle of the day. That's why we don't get any information from them. But uh, now the FIM, I won't have any trouble in being detrimental to. Yeah, well, that's yet. You have a history of being messed about <laughs> don't you, as, a, as a racer many years ago. No, it's. <laughs> I hate the nitpicking with things like that. I'd much rather let these guys get on with it. But well, I I I agree, obviously. But we're old school, so again, it's going to be one of those situations where safety must be paramount. And and at the end of the day, now that we're dealing with with times that are down to three decimal points, it, it, whereas exactly it's one ten back. And what you want to do? Yeah, we'll stop you going on there. We'll put grass there. See how you like that. You know, is the but that's. You see, I, I, obviously it's stupid. I'm exaggerating for effect. So there has to be a punishment of some sort. And it, it has it, to be consistent. It, it's got well, to yeah. be consistent. And I, again, I go to rugby, which shows the way to do this in real time, where if you have a new stock field, everybody in a ground and on telly can hear the referee literally go through a menu, go through the procedure. Is that a foul? Yes. Was it dangerous? Yes, that's a red card. Any mitigation? Well, yes, he was slipping. Okay, it's a yellow card, not a red. In real time, I know we're not rugby. I know we're not a ball sport, but that model of how the crowd, how the spectators and the crowd are told what's actually going on. I mean, I, I'm, I'm smiling. I'm smiling not because of the idea, because I like the idea. I'm smiling because I'm just trying to think of Freddie Spencer being concise. Yeah, Freddie Spencer. <laughs> Pretty words could be Christian Sarov. I've got notebooks. I've got Christian notebooks of Christian Sarov, you know, after race on about page three uh, and then on lap two. You know, it's right, well, right. Okay. From both of you, Jules, come to you first. So you're you're in the stewards' room, you're making the decision. You you see Pekka Banyai on the green stuff, it doesn't Ooh. trigger the sensor, but you can see with your eyes, you've got replay footage and common sense. What are you doing? I wanted to know if the sensors work. Okay. <laughs> Which could be yeah, it was arse covering, of course. Let, um, let me... Sorry, Jules, carry on. Sorry. But that, yeah, that, that, that's my first question. Why isn't that sensor work? Mm-hmm. And if it's okay, no, that's a long lens. The You know, it's it, it's an optical illusion. Okay, I'll buy that. But I do want to know if that bloody sensor's working. Okay. Now then, the opposing argument to that is 
if we rely on the sensor, which I think we should do, the visuals, imagine tennis. How many times did you sat watching yeah. the telly and said, it's out? Yeah. And then they put Hawkeye on there and it's yeah. not out. And my problem is, is with the, the camera, despite the fact we've got great high definition cameras looking at it, when you look at something moving at that kind of pace, your eyesight do not, even when you slow it down and so on and so forth, it's not exactly. pretty enough. Because it only does one, you know, every one twenty fourth of a second, you know, there's a frame. So there is, I, th th there's margin for error, exactly. So you have to rely on the sensor if it's working. Yeah, at, at which point, you know, the, the, you, all this old common sense thing has to be parked. There is a sensor. I don't care if you touch it with your knee, you know, with a Nat's whisker, last lap, whatever. If you touch it, you get a penalty. It has to be absolute. Okay. Well, so, anyway, I got lucky. It yes, seen. <laughs> got I think he saved for Binder. Yeah, I th and I think Ben and I got lucky. But let's not take away from the guy who rode a champions race, didn't he? After the first bad day he's had all year mm -hmm. during the sprint race, and he came back and he consolidated his championship position and rode like a world champion. He had to go. He wanted to have a go at Alex, uh, but he knew that. As far, well, as far as I put a move on him and just put just enough on him to make a, a yeah. real pass impossible. When, when that was Ducati happening. KTM. What? A Prilly Ducati KTM on the podium. Yeah. He'd have got money on that a few years ago. That is yeah. great. But, but, but Julian's right. You know, we've seen Peko crumble, make mistakes earlier on this season, you know, when it comes to sort of wheel to wheel battle and, and I was half expecting Aleish to, to to sling it around the outside like he did and, and then to, for Peko not to be able to, to to stay on his bike or to try something and, and fall off but 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 as you say he he rode like a like a champion actually and, well, was, like, and it was around the outside by him earlier on on yeah he wasn't it yeah. made your eyes water yeah. he's increased his championship lead that's what he was aiming for Aleish Spargo Aleish Spargo has nothing to do with anything to do with that so increasing right. your championship lead the one thing about Pecco is he ain't stupid. He knows what he's doing. He does, and he we know we know he listens to Keith. Um, now, <laughs> now, just quickly, yeah, intersperse in between the European motorcycles. We'll allow it earlier. Earlier on Sunday at the Suzuka Eight Hour, the single most important race in the world, Honda filled the top five places, which will at least at the home in head office recover quite a bit of honor and prestige but, but the reason for that is is they are allowed to do whatever they need to do to make those bikes the way that honda need to make them whereas in matter gp the rules changed and basically the flow was against honda because of their inertial platform and their ecu yes i they didn't uh, they, they needed their their electronics to make their motorcycle work as well as it did and as soon as we went to magneti morelli and it all changed that was when Honda's troubles started. And why aren't Honda's doing well in World Superbike? Uh, the bikes are developed for the eight hour and they're developed for use on Bridgestone tyres. Well, there it you makes go. all the difference. Yeah. Well, they may have recovered a little bit of honor there for Honda. Um, but we'll uh, get on to a little bit more Yamaha chat shortly. But now, as we've teamed up with uh, the Motormouth podcast, I must tell you to go check out the latest episode. Uh, which is with Dan Drury, who is Red Bull Racing's former systems engineer in Formula One. I know, he's turned to content creator. Um, you might know him as Engine Mode 11. He has all the inside gossip on Max Verstappen and Adrian Newey. So I know it's four wheels, but because we're now a team, Keith is going to make an appearance and chat all about his 100-year career. And uh, Motormouth will also be getting more and more famous stories from the world of two wheels. So do check out for that. Uh, and actually, in the latest Motormouth episode with Dan, he talks about Adrian uh, Newey being the true alien of Formula One. And we've had the alien conversation before in MotoGP, uh, but it seems like we're kind of lacking in it. And you talk about who Mark Marquez is maybe the, the only name that a, a broader audience might know. Fabio Quattararo? Who? Sorry, who? Bless you. Yeah. Well, who, who, the, who the hell knows? Yeah, I mean, aliens are um, not quite uh, prominent at the moment, are they? But I agree with you about Adrian Newey. I mean, he is an... I mean, doesn't matter <laughs> doesn't matter what discipline you support or come from or, 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 or most seen in, all of us recognise the, 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 the brilliant, yes. the genius of, of Adrian Newey and what he's achieved over so many years. And while we're on the subject of Formula One, um, wouldn't it great? I mean, the, 
one of the biggest Valentino Rossi fans, and even when he's wearing his Formula One gear, he, he wears a forty-six and, and, and yellow boots or whatever it was as well. Lando Norris, and the, he was at all. He was at all weekend. He was over the, over the whole thing, right across it. And he wasn't in the what quite often happens in Formula One. You can tell by the the, the kind of superstars they have in the back of their garage as to, to it's relative to how well they're doing or or the like. Whereas Lando Norris was seen in. Moto three garages. He was out, you know, he was out on the grid for Moto three and 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 checking out every aspect of it. Which I and he's kind of one of those kids that looks a little bit, you know, when he's got his silly hat on and and, and the like, you wouldn't recognise him. <laughs> but that's his brand. That's his brand. He was there. Norris was there. His teammate Oscar Piastri was there as well over the weekend. So but there was a bit of a Formula One presence. Um, but uh, but yeah, so do check out that that most math episode. It's really uh, uh, worth having a, a tune into, and we are sort of linked with them now. Um, but uh, on the way, we'll have a little bit more chat on Yamaha, some more Marquez, and take a look at Moto Two and Moto Three as well. Now, Yamaha <laughs> and Fabio Quattararo in particular. Uh, um, I don't know what do you say. I mean, a decent recovery, but oh, it was just a painful weekend for Fabio and Yamaha, wasn't it, Keith? I think his head's dropped, and I think that he's, he needs a new year almost, and 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 whatever they're going to do during the course of the year. New teammate next year, Alex Rins, um, should work out for him. I think that he's not going to scare the horses. Rins is going to be one of those teammates that he's a, he's he's quite a gentleman. He's quite a nice fella. He, they should get on well. Um, so that might well work out in future. But I just get the. I mean, Yamaha was a good motorbike around Silverstone back in the day, um, yeah. and it it just seems to have. Um, you know, we're we're in this terrible situation where I mean, where did he finish in the sprint race? Was it last? I seem to remember. Yeah, well, way down the order, twenty first in the sprint race. Morgan Daly qualified plum last. Yeah, fifteenth. Okay, the weather was not right. His confidence is not there at the moment. I've always said about Fabio Quattararo that he is a little bit too emotive for me um, to be the kind of weapon that he needs to be. You, you know, when things go wrong, he's smacking the tank and he's he's you know, jumping about a little bit, but it always seemed to be a bit too too much. Um, if this stuff gets to him in that manner, he's not working his way through the program at the moment. I mean, I think Yamaha have got a tough job ahead of them. I think they dropped the ball, in my view, some time ago. They didn't, they didn't bite the bullet and work hard in the areas they needed to. Aero, all those kind of things fell behind at Yamaha. There, there was no natural link for them should be working in an aero environment as far as i can remember everyone else has got something you know ducati have got the ferrari stuff ktm have got the red bull connection there's all these other aero entities that are around the the bike the bike teams aprilia is an interesting thing because they've got aero correct and seem to have got things quite right as well so the tie-up that they have with their partners seems to be working but yamaha and to some degree honda as well even though you know they they it, you know, they they seem to be just on the wrong foot regarding yeah. that stuff. Yeah, it's the, the Yamaha fall is quite shocking in in, in its abruptness. Uh, it's yeah, I mean Silverstone, high speed, long high speed corners. Yamaha should be happy there, and clearly the last thing it was was uh, anywhere near happy. It was a uh, it was shocking to see Morbidelli one minute. 29 seconds behind the leader at the flag. And he scored the last point, didn't he? Yeah. One minute 29, and he scored two points. He got 14 play I beg his pardon. Fabio, Fabio got the last point. But it's it's kind of crazy that we're talking about, you know, in a in a in a series where quite often 22 bikes are covered by less than a second. I know Silverstone is a different, it's a it's yeah. a unique track, and it's the longest track that we go to. And making a little bit extra here and there adds up to a lot by the time you get to the end of a lap, particularly if you're quick onto a straight or you, you've got a good, you know, trial situation off of a straight. It works quite well. I mean, it, it does lend itself towards the Ducati nowadays now that they've got them to steer in that middle of the corner. Now they've got them to turn. It's um, it's working so well for them. But it's a long way back. I mentioned it earlier on, Jules. You know, the engineering that has taken Ducati to get to where they've got to we we all know how long it takes to recover this sort of gap. It's infinite. Do you remember? Do you remember when um, the second team 
for Yamaha was coming online and they were talking about they needed engineering wise they needed the team to to agree in June of the previous year yes. so that they could get the engineering in line to actually when, have when the other way on take three more were recycling exactly. yeah um, and that and that gives you some indication of how long it takes the lead in time of engineering now I'm sure I'm sure you can speed that up um, if you chuck a load of money at it and, and buy a load of talent but Yamaha never did that and Yamaha I mean these are Yamaha's racing department is not some massive enterprise in a factory the size of an Amazon warehouse you know it's it's a it's basically quite a small workshop it's surprisingly you know low rent to look at to walk into even HRCs are really only the size of a you know a couple of semi attached houses it's uh, and the other has nothing like that and certainly money is an issue it's always an issue but you, you just feel that after Furusawa gave up the helm of Yamaha's racing, they just lost direction. There was no, and you know, without say Jorge Lorenzo or somebody like that in there with a Furusawa, there was no clear, strong direction. That's what it feels like. And they've not grasped the nettle of aero and electronics either. Yamaha are all at sea, which is why yep. they might be more happy at the moment than on a racetrack. That's not uh, And the trouble is, Keith, that we all know that in, as tight as that field is now, as you said, you can have an entire grid covered by a second. So every thousandth now of a second adds up and adds up and adds up and adds up, and you look terrible at the end of a race. They're going to have better. Um, they're going to have better races. I mean, at the end of the day, we've got a long haul. Now, now is the tough part of it. I mean, the, the, this this season really hasn't even started. It's just, it's just now. Silverstone launches in, into what is the the, the two thirds of the of the season still to come. Long hauls everywhere. Really, really tough uh, events that we've got to go to. We've got the the Indian round that's coming up as well at Bud International. That's that's going to be a first. So data, it's a flat line regarding data. Everyone's got to get going. You know from the get-go, from the start. And it's going to be a... One of the things that is... We've talked about the exhaustion that everyone's going to go through in this this next period of time. I mean, there's you know, something like 12 races over, you know, however, seven weekends or whatever it is, okay. over four continents or something. I can't remember the exact thing. It's hideous. There's a lot going on. Good time you to know, start a podcast. What me? <laughs> good time to start a podcast. <laughs> a good time to start a podcast because we're going to be flat out with it as well. But... The, the hospitality people who work harder than anybody else. Absolutely. Getting everything in order so everybody's fed, everybody's looked after. Then you've got the, the techs that are working in the teams to try and make sure everything is right for the riders. The riders, if anything, have the easiest job. Provided they're, not, agree. Provided they're not injured. And that's the point I was going to make. This championship is going to be made or, or broken on whether you can do what Peko did at Silverstone and take the points. Take those twenty points and not have a rush of blood, and try and get uh, get to, to the to the front. Yeah. When he, despite having had by his terms a disaster on the Saturday, hmm. it, it strength of the the mental strength of that's impressive. Yeah, well, he's uh, consolidated his leader at the top. Has Peko Bagnaia? He's got two hundred and fourteen points, forty one the gap to uh, Olga Marti in second. Uh, and uh, Bezeki after the, the fall, the several falls, uh, down to third with 167 points. That's what's going on in MotoGP. We'll come back to a bit more MotoGP chat, but I want to get on to Moto2 and Moto3. Now, because, I mean, Moto3 was awesome, um, but because Moto2 uh, was a little bit sidelined due to the times, uh, let's start with Moto2. Um, for Ben Adeguer, winning his first Grand Prix ahead of Aaron Kinnett and Pedro Acosta. Um, first of all, Julian, what did you make of, of the Moto2 action? What did, what do you ever make of Moto2 action? <laughs> uh, it's, the thing that stood out for me was how many times is Aaron Canet going to finish second? <laughs> um, and it was won by a speed-up, not a Calix. And my memory, which is probably imperfect, says that when speed-ups have won before, it's been on the tracks where the odd track where they worked and the gap would be big 
and in similarly on most tracks the gap would be big the other way with the speed up at the back but it was a proper fight the speed up versus the Calyxes mm. on what looked to me like even turns. What's going to happen is is we're going to see a load more. They're not speed ups anymore, Jules. You've been out of it too long. Oh, sorry. I beg his pardon. But it's going to be a situation where I'm surprised there's more balls he's on the track this year. I think next year we're going to think it seems to be working better everywhere. I mean, it's always had a good, it's always had a good rep at turn at Silverstone anyway. Um, but I've got, I've got to say, Fermin Aldeguer, massively beautiful way that he went about it, apart from the way he unloaded himself when he got in the park for <laughs> Yes, that's not true. I, f- I feared for the mechanic's ankles, frankly. But well, thought- very nearly. I mean, but the, the, the trouble is, they've got, I've seen it. I've seen Top Rack, Razgeli Yogbu, do the same thing in World Superbikes because he always comes in and stands the thing on the front nose. But uh, they forget that it's carpet that they talk to. Damn. to uh, Path burns are never a good thing at the end of a race. That is for certain. Indeed. Uh, down he went. But, um, right, you're right about Canet. Is he ever going to win one? Yes, he is, I think. Um, and Acosta is in there as well. I mean, there's another oh. name. It's, but it, 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 a massive talent. But still, um, for me, you know, the, the Mudder 2 race was, was, the, the, was the biggest disappointment of the weekend for me because Jake Dixon, who was absolutely pumped, had the pace. You know, he was there all weekend on pace, but just let it get away from him in qualifying, dumped it on that final corner. Um, and then lo and behold, the end of the first lap, I mean, tangling with Darren Binder. And, you know, Binder... Well, hang on. Keith, hang on, hang on, hang on. Should Darren Binder be banned? No. No, not in my view. I think the situation is, is that to start with, Jake Dixon was out of place on the grid. How many times, Jules, have we talked about this? Remember Jorge yeah. Lorenzo at Argentina when he got yeah. himself this needs This needs saying again and again. If you mess up qualifying, you're in a world of pain because you're among people you never race with and you don't know how to behave and you've got some interesting traffic to negotiate. Well, well you're trying to more interesting with Darren Binder. That is for sure. Now, don't get much more interesting than Darren Binder. Absol- absolutely, the yeah, point. My view of it, for what it's worth, uh, and again, you know, like the, the stewards issued a long lap penalty. Some yeah. people scream that isn't enough, and, and obviously, quickly. you know, it was a situation where the long lap penalty may have been fair enough, but I would have said it was a fairly borderline situation. Personally, I mean, Darren Binder was on the inside. Jake Dixon was a, a little ahead on the outside of him, yeah. and they basically pushed together and down went Dixon on the end of the final on the end of the first lap it's a long race to make up places and if you're going to tangle you know it's all very well screaming that he's got a reputation but if you know that already he's probably the least guy you ride around the outside of yeah yeah would be my uh, view and forget the two personalities from it just look at the incident if it was I don't know pick two names Aya Gura and Joe Roberts or somebody like that you'd have said racing incident but and my first, and before I'd seen any replays, watching the race, my first instinct was, what the hell, that's a quick penalty. They're doing him for his previous. Yeah, that's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting viewpoint. Um, Literally, this is no analysis. That's what occurred to me. The only thing I can say is is that they do have access to everything immediately uh, where they are. Um, it's not just tele- it's not like just television replays like we're looking at. Yeah. Like they obviously have everything, and that corner is very well um, looked at from yeah. uh, from a camera yeah. point of view. And uh, you know, race direction took that. And it was notable the TV commentators when I watched the uh, the replay the, uh, on Sunday night didn't think that anybody had done anything really bad. Were you watching that on MotoGP.com or on Scott on BT? Whatever it's called nowadays, TNT. TNT. Well, that it's funny because Hodgie was quite... Um, I mean, I know he's a mate of Jake's, um, yeah. but, I mean, he stuck a mic under Jake Dixon's face while Jake was still red hot, which I yeah. always think, from a broadcast point of view, you need to be a little bit careful of. And unfortunately, I think Jake has said a few things that this morning he might think, well, that is what I thought at the time. I've, my, I've, I've mellowed a little bit on it. I mean, you, you can imagine the disappointment. That you're hungry, oh. you have the potential to win it. And, and a guy that's got a reputation for, for um, well, he's known as Dive Bomb Dip Binder at the end of the day. Um, 
and he's known for bashing everything except the pace car in, in previous yeah. Grand Prix. Yeah. yeah, it's a situation where you can imagine the disappointment, and he was in full flow when he said, "Ban him, he's an idiot, you know, yeah. da, 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 he's ruined my championship and so on. He even Don't turned to camera to say it all as well, didn't he? Look right down the lens. Yeah. Well, the only good thing to come out of that particular bloody rant was the fact that he said, I'm going to go out and win every race now. So that's, uh, yeah. I like a bit of positivity from the negative side. <laughs> <tonight, laughs> and the, it was a disaster for all of us. I mean, uh, the people started to go home as soon as he'd fallen down. Well, Absolutely. Ian says, how can so many Brits have so much bad luck in one weekend? Um, Sam Lowe has got seven. Direct. Yes, that's true. Home race. Sam Lowe's got seventh, though. You know, fond farewell. Right. Yeah. You think back to, I don't know, Jason Vincent, James Toneland, how many other Brits, you know, had done something really, oh my God, no, on the first lap at our home race after, you know, a couple of weeks of handle cranking, flag waving, and painting Union Jack on things that probably shouldn't have had them painted on. Yeah. You're probably right with that. Imagine how you would have felt if you'd been in Marvel 3 on the front row. Oh, don't. Scott was... Ogden. I felt bad because I interviewed him the night before and I was like, are we going to get are we gonna get Ogden on the podium to all the like, the, the, the crowd and everyone's cheering and then for him to do that. And so so what actually happened? He, he, he just stalled it simply, Keith. Very difficult motorbikes to restart. You can't yeah. restart them very easily. You've got to get them on. You've got to, you'll see, for anybody that's not used to, Speedway bikes, motor three bikes, single cylinder, high compression machinery. You got to pull them back on, have it in bottom gear, pull them back on compression to get the piston in the right place, so that when you dump the clutch, whether you've got the electric star underneath it or whether somebody's pushing you, it's in the right position to fire straight away. It's 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 quite an art form to to get the thing restarted. So you're not going to be able to restart it on the grid because a you're not going to have a long enough run up to get enough pushing into to get the thing to to turn, you've got a very high first gear as well. Remember, um, you know, in that situation, so you got to be you got to be running fairly fast. That's why they have electric starters that pop under the back wheel, spin the wheel, and the the centrifugal force, if you like, of the of the wheel when you dump the clutch, it uh, it, it fires the bike up. Um, but I mean, it's a it's a fairly difficult thing to do. So he was screwed. Um, the only lucky thing, I suppose, was that he was able to start from the back of the grid rather than pit lane, which he would have then had to have waited until everyone had gone past a certain point on the track. The very last man went past, and then the light turns green. So you're, you've are you got a penalty on top of a penalty if you start from pit lane, really. So, But, I mean, it was the... You talk about luck. I mean, like, that kid must have woken up this morning feeling devastated. I mean, we've... It happens. It happens. All those bikes around you are so loud. You know, like, you will have practiced starts all your life. You will have, you know, been in that situation so many times. But the one that counts, I mean, we even had Michael Laverty, who is the team owner of Vision Track. Um, you know, he interviewed um, Scott Ogden on the grid. Now, even with Michael, who he's used to having around him, Scott seemed very, very, very nervous, massively yeah. tense. So that mistake is surprising and unsurprising in equal measures. I mean, I bless him. I've, and he's the real deal, Scott Ogden. He had the pace completely. He's he's fast, no question. Uh, but it it's that some people cope with the hometown pressure. Some thrive on it. Others, and you know, the list is very long. Who have succumbed to that? Bad though for for the fans that have endured an entire weekend, uh, you know, oh. sites and the like. They were looking forward to the Jake Dixon, Scott Ogden bloody performance, and those yeah. are the two that um, formed in here. Absolutely, by a long way, because Scott Ogden can go to Austria in a couple of weeks and try again. You know, that somebody who's been so hypothermia from Saturday from uh, the Woodcote Grandstand or something can't. Josh Watley. I mean, he again, he carried forward a, a double long lap penalty into this yeah. race. So Josh Watley was was out of it wherever he qualified and whatever he did. He wasn't going to be doing anything. He wasn't going to go to trouble the score as whatever happened this weekend because of the, the reasons you've said, absolutely. Yeah, it was a, a shame a shame for, for the British side of things. But, I mean, what a race anyway for Moto3, right, Jules? I mean, first Colombian to stand on the top step is it David Alonso uh, ahead of Zaki and Holgado. Yeah, it's there's this cloud. You know, I, I've been out of the paddock now full time for a long, for a good few years, and I look at a Moto Three and go, "Who are these children?" 
uh, you know, and it's just another cloud of super talented, super professional, mid teenage Spaniards, plus the old South American, but there's a Brazilian lurking in there as well. And you think, my God, and I tend to find anybody who doesn't speak Spanish in here, and I'll have a look back and think, oh, Danny Baltus, that's quite impressive. You know, for a big lad, he's going well, for instance. Last year it was Philip Salach who's got the gone up to Moto too. Because if you're a Spanish team, well a Spanish rider, you just uh, you just go to the junior world champion and say, You, 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 come here. It's that simple. And they are all they've been in the junior world championship. They've basically been free riders for two, three years before they got anywhere near a Grand Prix paddock. And they look like it, and they ride like it. Put them on a big, wide track. Let's say it and say it loud and often. Fast tracks mean good racing. And on a motor three field, it's wonderful to watch. Also a bit of a lottery at times. That said, that said, the winner fully deserved. It was a beautiful, beautifully considered ride. I felt sorry for the bloke rummaging around in the drawer at Silverstone trying to find the Colombian national anthem. I was just looking at the Autosport website. They usually have the national flags next to the rider with the result. They haven't got the Colombian flag in there. I'll tell you what, though. I, I like the Colombian national anthem. I could hear more of that. It sounded quite well. It, it, nice change. Yes, yeah, more for it. And more it was the second closest 15 riders in history. Was it? That's the fast track. Wasn't spread them out. No stupid chicanes. And then, where was Moreira, the Brazilian lad? He was one in the top ten, wasn't he? He was seventh, wasn't he? Yeah, seventh, yeah. So, that, you know, that there is, uh, maybe there's, a, maybe there's a, yeah, a, a few South Americans on the way. Mm. Well, David Alonso, okay. best best rookie in the standings and uh, and up to sixth now in, in the championship. Yeah. Um, Holgado uh, tops it, 141 points. got the 22-point gap to Sasaki and, uh, and uh, Jamal Messia. And then and um, Moto Two, of course, it's Pedro Costa who leads, but by a very slim margin, only two points. Uh, but you know, Jake Dixon, despite a bit of a disastrous weekend, just about uh, holds on to third in the yeah. title for the time being. But there's, there's, I suppose, after the little break we've had as well, there's a lot of chat and and right, you know, we've had the Morbidelli news. There's riders under pressure. There's there's talk of movement, and now we're getting to that point of the year where contracts are discussed. And I know. There are some riders that are locked in for for a couple of seasons or whatnot. But with the Morbidelli news, I think there was talk of um, uh, Digi looks like he's he's out at Grassini. He doesn't look like yeah. he's done a good enough job. Paul Spargro, of course, back on the grid this weekend. But where does he find his future with the likes of Pedro Costa? Because we all know that KTM need to find him a space. What, well, Paul Espar- what does Paul want to do? Hmm. Paul Espargo is still coming back from a massive injury. That that crash he had at the beginning of the season was a real big beating. You know, that, you know teeth, jaw, you know, all the kind of things that you, you wouldn't normally smack on the side, full of ribs, loads of vertebrae. It was a horrible, horrible accident. I, I mean, I think he had a good weekend. You know, to Silver in no kind of iffy condition. Brilliant weekend. I, mean, I don't really recall Paul as anyone's I know of a wet weather rider. Mm. No. So it was Pete, Pete McLaren um, from Crash.net, everyone will be uh, familiar with, with Pete. I had a dinner with him over the weekend, and he said about Paul has actually lost height. He's he's yeah. shorter now because after that incident. And you just think, <laughs> whoa. Jules and I are familiar with that because as you get older, you do lose height. In your <laughs> case, you've got to lose about six inches, Harry. Yeah. yeah. Somebody <laughs> took a picture of me interviewing Sam Lowe's, and they was like, you make Sam like a jockey. And I was like, well, he's kind of short anyway, but fine. <laughs> That's about the size the bike riders are. Exactly. You can't be a big bike rider. It just doesn't work. <laughs> you see, I remember some big behind Jorge Lorenzo in the Q4 airport in Argentina or somewhere going, God, he's tiny. Because the F got the letters and the A, you know, and the padding. Yeah, they're not. Well, he looked like we're, we're not even born. We're not even going to see yet. Danny Pedroso at an airport. I remember oh. him having a fight with one of them um, petition things. And it, yes. and it he, won. He he yeah. could get he could get away with okay we're now boarding families with children under twelve yeah. and uh... <laughs> I tell you one thing that was quite interesting I bumped into Deck Crutchlow Derek Crutchlow um, Cal's dad at uh, Silverstone always good to see Deck I mean it 
He is the man you want to be when you get into your 70s, that is for sure. He's, uh, oh, he's, hey, mate, I'm there. I want to be Deck Crutchlow. <laughs> yeah, he's got, it, he's got it well covered, Deck has, that's for sure. But Cow is out testing a lot at the moment, and he will be riding in Japan. So uh, that's a definite. Mm. Um, Quite a few British fans saying, well, why didn't Cow ride at Silverstone? And the answer is because all the test it is in Japan. And Danny Pedrosa is is testing a lot at the moment as well, and he'll be riding as well again later in the year. So we're going to have. Riding Aust- have they announced any wild cards for Austria? Do you know what? It's funny you should mention wild cards. Yeah, we just don't seem to have as many of them anymore, no, do we? No. I mean, not across any of the classes. Whether this is a function of the times we live in and money. Uh, we've had a, mi- a million and one reserve riders coming onto the grid to, t- to take the actual spots for the Grand Prix uh, riders because of the sprint kicking up all sorts of trouble. Um, I, I've often thought that there must be some way in which Grand Prix teams could have a reserve rider. We thought about it. Who, you know, who is present at every single race. Yes. Yeah. I think we're going to be in that situation, Jules. I mean, I alluded to it earlier on with the with the, the, the long hauls that we've got and the tracks that exactly. we've got and yeah. they're so close. I think we are going to be in a situation where not just riders, I think team members. I think you're going to have, you know, across the board, you're going to need a, a second string and a backup team. Uh, 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 Harry, was it the NASCAR boys who have two pick was NASCAR out of the races? And they leap from each other from, you know, they do every. Some one lot do the odd numbers, the other lot do the even numbers. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. well in, a, they, they, round in a year, and uh, at the end of the day, they can't get from one place to the other. Don't you remember, Jules? I covered NASCAR and I'm good old oh, guy. Of you did in your deep and dark art. Oh. Yes. NASCAR's Keith Ewan joins us this weekend. Yeah. Uh, well, I tell you what, NASCAR had some of the best named drivers in the world. My favourite is Dick Trickle. Yeah, I knew that. I knew where that was going. I just knew it. Mark um, Shot Jones, he was another one. That's like something have a 1940s cowboy movie. Yeah. It? <laughs> what was it? Buckshot, he had the zero zero on the side of his car because that's the designation for Buckshot, for the big shot in a, in a shotgun. <laughs> and again, again, you educate me, Mr. Heron. Yeah, you should be back on that NASCAR coverage, I think, you and I think you're doing a <laughs> decent job still. Um, look, well, go on then. On that note, I think we've just about run out of time uh, for our, our first episode back. Um, but uh, plenty to discuss. Uh, and actually, it's a, it's a weekend off before we then get completely into it with, with Austria kicking things off. Um, so we return to the Red Bull ring in, in just over a week or so's time. Uh, Jules? Two images I'd like to leave you with, Harry, that will see oh, with please. me. Please. No. Last lap, hang a straight. Alicia Spargo has just taken the lead and he's under the paint. Going at a beautiful camera shot. You you could not have got any closer or lower on one stream on that motorbike. He was un, not under the bubble, he was under the paint. And the other one, watching Maverick Vinales is on board shoulder cam or whatever it was, as he was flicking with the uh the attitude, you know, the Ride height adjustment. Ride height. Thank you, Keith. Uh, devices. What? The, the job's changed a bit, hasn't it? I tell you what. You know what my memory's like, Julian. I have difficulty rem- remembering my own name sometimes. I'm saying it then for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those situations where there's so much stuff now, uh, and of course, when they're putting the board out and making recommendations as well, you know, you know picking up whichever program that they want to plug into them it's a bit like it's getting a bit like formula one from that point of view there's so much going on on the steering yes and at 200 odd mile an hour on a motorbike in the wet it's a bit hectic with two with a 18 18 other raving psychos trying to have a bit of tarmac yeah oh, oh what a time well those are some fantastic images uh, i think to to leave us with thank you so much julian Ryder, for, for joining us on our on our first Brand new episode of the OMG MotoGP podcast. We get it. We'll, we'll have to get you back at some stage if you'll come back. Oh, I will. Absolute pleasure.
Uh, so we got that. Have an argument, Jules. So we'll have to put that for later. You have to put that right. We'll have to find somebody to have an argument. Oh, for absolutely, uh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you as well for listening and watching wherever you may be. Make sure you're tuned in across OMG Moto GP our social medias. Just search OMG Moto GP on anything, and we will come up and we will be right back with you next week to look forward uh, to all things Austria. You can get your questions in. Email us a thirty second voice note OMG Moto GP at gmail dot com, or you can just tweet us. Uh, your questions, Instagram and Facebook as well. And really importantly, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcast as well, because it really helps with the algorithm. Like and subscribe, all that jazz. Uh, but from Keith Ewan and myself, Harry Benjamin, and from Julian Ryder, thank you very much. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.